It's important that people um, realize that um, the, the current situation with high potency THC, the fact that it's available in dispensaries and legal in 19 states, and the fact that for some it's medicine, all of that doesn't mean that it's um, harmless for young people. Welcome to the Sandstone Care Podcast, where we help teens, young adults, and their families overcome the challenges that come with substance use, addiction, and mental health conditions. Welcome to the Sandstone Care Podcast with me, Clint Malley. Today, we are talking all about marijuana use, weed use, whatever you want to call it, among teens and young adults. And we have an amazing guest for you today, Dr. Ken Winters. So he is a senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute and a consultant to the National American Indian and Alaska Native Technology Transfer Center. Previously, he was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota when he founded and directed the Center for Adolescent Substance Use research for 25 years. He's published over 140 peer-reviewed articles and numerous book chapters during a 30-plus year period, and he's a frequent speaker and workshop trainer. All that to say that Dr. Ken Winters knows his stuff when it comes to teen and young adult uh, marijuana use. So, Dr. Ken, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Clint. I look forward to our conversation. So a little bit of context, when I first got into this industry, so the treatment industry or the addiction and mental health industry, I had in my mind that it was hard drugs or what we tended to think of as hard drugs. I was thinking about like heroin, I was thinking about opioids, I was thinking about alcohol, right? And when I learned that with Sandstone Care, one of the most the, the largest population of students or people that we serve, teens and young adults that we serve, comes around marijuana, right? And its effects internally, externally, physically, mentally, all of those things, um, and how it impacts the person. And as you know, that marijuana is now legal in Colorado, right? Um, and so that's also added to that kind of escalation of problems. And so you know, I want to start by probing and setting the stage. Why do teens smoke marijuana? Well, they are using marijuana um, for the same reason they might be using other substances. And marijuana, you know, serves a similar purpose as, as the others do. Um, you know, usually a teenager will probably start out using something like cannabis because they're... Um, their friends are using. They may have thought about how it um, maybe relieves tension, makes them feel different, and feeling different can sometimes mean you feel better. Um, and so you're getting, you know, psychological relief. Or for many, it's a mix of that plus um, it's recreational. It's fun. It it may make you feel like you're having a better time at a party or with friends. And in fact, you, you may reflect and say you, you were more entertaining and had a better time. You know, enhance, it enhances listening to music. It might enhance how you emotionally feel about others around you. So, you know, the acute effects of most substances, including cannabis, for most people is that it's rewarding. Um, and then once you get into a habit, though, then you get cravings and you want to use it more and more. And so some at some point you're crossing in a a dangerous threshold where your use is more than just the, the acute rewards, but you're using it because you, you have an urge and a, and a craving to use it. And you don't like the feeling of not having it in your system. Then that's referred to as acute withdrawal symptoms. Now, these aren't the, 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 the blatant physical withdrawal symptoms that you get when somebody is way at the deep end of addiction, but you have these sort of minor, um, angst because you realize, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm a little off edge because I'm, I'm not high anymore. And I, so I, I got to go back to my drug to, to satisfy um, those acute feelings. So what turns out to be, you know, perhaps a fun recreational viewed as a harmless activity can then lead to downstream problems. 
So I hear you saying that part of the reason why teens or young adults might start is, hey, it feels good, right? We tend to do the things that make us feel good. And then what I hear you saying is that later on, there also becomes that withdrawal component that you might see with other types of addictions. Can you explain a little bit more about how at first something might seem like, hey, this is just something that I do for fun, and then the withdrawal kind of ends up being the controlling factor in continued use? Yeah, this this sort of acute withdrawal, it, some people call it a funk, uh, not feeling just right. You feel off a little bit um, because your body got used to the nice feeling, the acute rewards. So you want to return to that. Um, and when and if you've used enough, your neurochemistry has changed a certain amount. And so it also is signaling your brain that it needs more of the substance. So it's 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 a dual problem or a dual issue. The person remembers how well they felt and how rewarding the experience was, so they want to return to that. And then also you've got your body saying, um, yes, um, I'm not feeling exactly 100% right now. I need something to take the edge off of uh, this funk I'm in. Now, drugs vary a lot uh, across this general principle I'm talking about. Um, and humans do too. So, you know, some don't have these kind of acute feelings readily. Some do. And of course, that can dictate, well, how much more you want to use the drug, or I call it how much it might lead to more craving. General term, craving, you know, I want to use it for various reasons. Um, And so these individual differences come into play. Um, And luckily, some people aren't prone to this phenomenon, and some people are a bit more prone, and that probably leads to a greater risk of having a, a drug problem. One thing about marijuana's impact on humans, it's probably more variable how people react to the active and and intoxicant uh, chemical in the plant, THC, than than other substances. So I always talk to teenagers about alcohol. For most alcohol users or the most of us, we get a pretty much a uniform feeling to um, intoxication with alcohol. There's disinhibition. You feel relaxed. You feel a little more comfortable. Um, socially, you feel better. You feel like it's easier to talk. It's it's called disinhibitory effect. And most people have that feeling. Some, some of us need to drink a lot to get that feeling. Some of us can get that feeling quickly. Anyway, with THC, there's a lot more variability. Some people feel very relaxed right away and their anxiety goes away and they're in a great relaxing mood, um, love to um, listen to music, um, small talk with people, etc. Some, though, they react um, with a very negative um, cognitive reaction. They, they get suspicious. They feel like their, their thoughts are swimming, hard to control, talking and thinking. Um, it, it's quite negative. Um, and for many, that's so negative, they don't, they don't go back to it. But for some, they still feel like um, they might get some positives out of it, so they continue to use. So they might get a mix of, of jumbled thinking, but some relaxation. And, and of course, that could be a, you know, a bad habit to get into because the, uh, the, the negative parts of it may, may come to uh, be quite harmful to the person. So I hear you saying that, hey, we can't put all of the reasons why someone will use marijuana into one bucket, right? Because it affects everybody very differently. And so some people might be trying to dull a trauma or an experience, right? And then some people might want to smoke to be able to engage more in an experience, right? Um, And so there's this, this kind of differentiation that makes it difficult. And so I think it's important from the onset to not jump in and say, you're smoking because you're lazy or you're smoking because um, you just want to uh, not care about the world. That's that's not a blanket statement that we can make, right? And I think that you kind of led us to our next question, you know, and that's how does marijuana affect teens and young adults? You know, let's talk about the physical, emotional, and even the neurological component of that. So 
Most drugs, including the hot cannabis, um, will affect people's emotions, the way they think, and then activities that require motor coordination. And with, with cannabis, um, it looks like it has a significant impact on people's ability to, to remember and learn. Now, that can occur um, acutely. You know, uh, smoke before school, you might have trouble learning what was taught during the day. There are concerns that chronic use will contribute to a, a significant loss of somebody's cognitive abilities downstream as an adult. Uh, some provocative research along those lines. Um, and so more than just, okay, I'm not going to learn today. Uh, if I don't smoke on the next day, I'll learn what's in, in school that day. So that's temporary. But a chronic user may be um, damaging their ability to, to learn a lot downstream, and that can impact um, adulthood. Um, emotions and, and how you react to stress, um, I put that in kind of the same bucket. These are impacted by, by using THC. So um, now for some, it, it will calm your emotions, but for some, it means um, you're, you're, you would have trouble um, controlling um, your stress, your anxiety. And for those that are prone to depression, there's a big concern that that actually elevates your risk of suicidal thinking. Um, and by the way, if you have a risk of mental illness in your family or you have early signs of it, whether it's depression, psychosis, anxiety disorders, this is a, a major public health uh, principle for young people. Stay away from THC. This high potency THC that's out there it looks to be extremely damaging to some people's mental health when they have a risk for, for mental health problems. And the third is, is uh, impacting, you know, physical coordination, motor coordination. So if you're not an athlete, you might not care. Um, but uh, it's, it means it's going to impact something that's very important to teenagers, and that's driving. So it's, it's a myth that uh, being high on THC does not impair driving. It does. It has a lot of impact on judgment. Um, your ability to attend properly to uh, uh, your driving task. It makes you more distractible. You actually are very bad at uh, estimating um, uh, speed and estimating when you need to uh, turn or react to someone else, another driver who might be making a mistake. Um, and it's, if you mix in alcohol and THC, there's about eight impairments that the researchers have studied. And so alcohol adds about four driving impairments and, and cannabis adds another four. So it's, it's, uh, that, that really creates a lot, of, a lot of driving problems. By the way, one sidebar on driving. People think that they are not high anymore, and so they falsely believe they're safe behind the wheel. But if you measure impairment, they still are impaired for a significant period of time. There's about a 40-minute window where <clears throat> um, the THC – Perception is that you're okay, but the THC impairment is is uh, is not good. Hmm. Yeah, and so there's this emotional side, and then there's this physical side. And one of the things that I've learned through talking with experts like you is that oftentimes people who have a substance use or substance abuse problem that they also have an underlying mental health condition, that there's this kind of co-occurring or dual diagnosis. And, and so marijuana plays a role in that, right? Like that though for some people, marijuana use recreationally might not be a big deal, but if there's an underlying mental health challenge, then it could be an overwhelming barrier that gets in the way of them being able to feel mentally whole, right? So can you kind of dive a little bit deeper into, into what you've seen with like dual diagnosis or, or people having a substance abuse and a underlying mental health condition? Yeah, it's, it's a very important topic you're raising. Um, we're learning more about it. And then unfortunately, the news um, always seems to point in one direction that, um, Using THC, if you have a risk for mental illness, elevates your risk of getting the mental illness. 
if you have already um, have a mental illness and already showing early signs, it probably just aggravates your symptoms and makes the course of your disorder worse. Um, I call it taking two steps forward, sorry, one step forward by thinking, okay, my, uh, you know, I like the, the temporary two hour relief I get from, from marijuana, but you're taking two steps back when it comes to um, your long-term mental health. And what's particularly troublesome is the high potency of THC that's so tip common these days that's available to young people, whether you're uh, just buying the leaf version, which can still have THC potency levels of near 15, 20%, or if you're dabbing or using oils and then vaping, you can get products that are as high as, well, up to 90% THC. Um, and so in the potency of THC has also been linked to our principle that um, there's a risk between using this product and your mental health. Some, some pretty strong studies uh, now are starting to, uh, to track individuals and, and the kind of THC they're using and how their mental illness is progressing and it's all negative. You know, the high end THC leading to, to worse course of the mental illness, lower THC potency, a little bit better. The other big problem is if you use during adolescence, these high potency products, um, because the brain is still significantly developing and the uh, THC impacts this brain development process in, in multiple ways. This is um, troubling um, you know, public health officials. Um, the, the impact is, is not just on you know, your emotions, but it looks like it's impacting um, brain regions that are developing that are important for your overall mental health. Um, and so um, definitely uh, there's a nasty link um, a troublesome one. And it, it's important for prevention uh, programs to emphasize this. That's an important for parents who, who may know family history or maybe see early signs or know of early signs in their teenager. Um, but it, 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 it means that it's even more prominent uh, prevention issue that has to be part of, uh, of our community as well as in the home. So you talked about how THC levels within marijuana have been on the rise, right? That now there is more and more uh, THC within marijuana, especially as it's become legalized and over the years. I just wanted to say, as a 32-year-old, I am having friends all the time who are coming to me now who are saying, hey... I just got diagnosed with this, <laughs> right? Like I've been in therapy and I was just formally diagnosed with Asperger's or, you know, um, disassociative identity disorder, right? Like there was always these things in mental health that were uh, challenging for this person and made doing everyday things in life really um, something that was seemed insurmountable sometimes, like going through school or holding down a job or relationships, right? And so there might be parents or young adults who are saying, look, you know, like I'm good, <laughs> right? Um, or I don't think that so-and-so has, has any type of mental health condition. And I'll let you know that I thought the same thing with my friends. When they told me these things, I both felt oh my gosh, that's crazy. I, I had no idea. And then at the same time, I also thought, well, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? And so I think, um, especially for our parents or for our young adults who are like, hey, like I'm having a lot of difficulty doing these things that it seems like are pretty standard for, you know, the typical human in our society. And, but I don't know if I have a mental health disorder. It's like, hey, like, be aware of that, especially when it comes to marijuana use, because, because oftentimes there are these underlying mental health issues that we just don't even know about, right? Or, or haven't surfaced yet. And so, you know, you talked about being addiction and how there's like this elevated THC in marijuana. And so I think a lot of parents are wondering, you know, could my teen be addicted to marijuana or, you know, 
can you overdose on marijuana? So could you speak a little bit to that from what you've seen in the changes of marijuana and the marijuana industry and also, you know, the potential for being addicted or for overdosing? It's, it's one of the interesting debates uh, to have with young people and parents because on one side, there's the argument, well, the cannabis plant is natural. So how could that be harmful or lead to addiction? Um, which is a myth in some ways. Um, heroin comes from a natural plant as well. Um, and then there's the, um, the issue of can you overdose on marijuana? If, and if you can't, then how could that be an addictive substance or, or harmful? Um, and people are correct. Technically, um, a fatal overdose with, with too much THC, I don't know if there's yet any um, incidents of that in the literature. You can have an acute overdose reaction because uh, that can lead to um, a, a very uh, acute psychotic episode where, again, you feel um, like you're uh, in some kind of a, a emotional negative state, feel very scared, feel like you've lost control of your emotions and your thinking, um, and that can lead some to need some professional help, at least uh, um, at emergency room level. But all of that doesn't mean that it isn't addictive or that it isn't harmless because there's so many other layers. Um, so can you get addicted to a substance where there isn't the classic withdrawal overdose type symptom? Yes. And there's other substances like that. Can people get addicted to nicotine? Yes. Has anyone ever died of a lethal overdose of nicotine? Extremely rare. But of course, we all know you can get addicted to it. Um, so the, the symptoms of those that have a cannabis use disorder, kind of the new term for being addicted to cannabis, are, are, are identical um, with slight variations, I should say, um, in language to the other substances. So there's loss of control. There's using uh, way beyond what you had planned. Um, and there's use with negative consequences that are accelerating. And you can have withdrawal. We've talked about that. And you can have tolerance. So the, the classic symptoms are there. Um, the risk for it is elevated if you start using in the teen years and you use some of that high-end THC potency products. Um, and so parents need to realize if they were using as teenagers in the 60s and 70s or knew about its use back then, it was you know, much milder version. And so nowadays that mild version is not on the streets. It's not what's typically sold in the stores. So it's, it's a much different product. It just makes all of our risk assessment different. And that's why that's so important for parents to recalibrate how they, they see it. And just because it's medicine also doesn't mean it's harmless. It can be harmful as a lot of medicines that are really psychoactive substances. They can, of course, lead to harm as well. So um, it's important that people um, realize that um, uh, the, the current situation with high potency THC, the fact that it's available in dispensaries and legal in 19 states, and the fact that for some it's medicine, all of that doesn't mean that it's um, harmless for young people. Um, and you brought up the, um, you know, the impact it has on the brain, and, and it's so important. Uh, we stress this principle with parents so much that um, we now know that the teen brain is developing in significant ways during the adolescent years, particularly right around that 13 to 17 age range, when a lot of young people start using substances, including cannabis. Um, and cannabis affects that so many processes in the brain that's being developed that and this is why people are very concerned about how it has a negative impact on learning, uh, emotional regulation, uh, motor coordination, and these kinds of things. Yeah, there seems to be that cyclical effect too. When I was a teacher and I knew that students were using marijuana, right? Like those are the students who would also fall behind, right? A lot of those students also um, had learning disabilities, right? And so it becomes this effect they 
use marijuana because they don't want to go to school and feel triggered or frustrated or traumatized when they're not able to engage with the content because they're behind grade level. And then because they're, you know, having the underlying effects of being high, even if it's the next day or two days afterwards, right? Then they're also, their, their motor pathways are not working as well so that they're falling further behind, right? Which again, makes them not want to engage in school, which again, makes them fall further behind, right? So it becomes this vicious cycle that you see, especially within the teen years. So when it comes to that brain development and uh, the brain growing or the brain uh, being able to form new neural pathways, what do we know about the effects of THC and brain chemistry or neuroscience? Well, one thing they've discovered is that we have a lot of receptors in the brain that are called cannabinoid receptors in multiple regions in the area of the brain that have to do with learning, emotion, uh, motivation, uh, motor coordination. Um, and they are important for those regions being developed or maturing during the teen years. So we have natural receptors that are related to the cannabis plant, but these natural receptors and the chemicals they produce and the processes they impact are part of normal and healthy brain development. So one concern is that when you overexcite these receptors by using THC, particularly high potency THC, you are disrupting the ability of those receptors to do their normal healthy work on your brain development. One study, the best that I've seen so far, has now, you know, did the right kind of uh, longitudinal work where they had brain scans of young teenagers, and then they waited five years and rescanned the, that group of teens. They're about 800. And many of them had already used cannabis in between the two brain scans. So no one had used during the baseline brain scan, and then many had used when they did the follow-up. And then they looked at, of course, how is the brain development looking for those that used cannabis and the ones that didn't? And sure enough, there were um, significant and several alterations in, in brain development in the cannabis using group. And if you read the, the article, the authors are particularly concerned because the alterations, they say, were the most significant in parts of the brain that are implicated when you have mental illness. Um, which, of course, could help explain why we're, we see the nasty link between early cannabis use and, uh, and course of mental illness. So it's if you are ever going to use any substance at all, if it's in your history, <laughs> in your life, it's just best to wait till you're about age 25. If, of course, if you can withhold um, and just maybe stick with um, uh, recreational use of, of alcohol, a beverage once in a while, that's probably the uh, safe level of using a, a substance that's legal, but um, it, it's just a, you're adding so much more risk to your health if you um, uh, indulge in substances, including cannabis during the teen years. Wow, yeah, I, I didn't know that study that's, that's kind of like drawing out, okay, this is something that's actually connected to not just brain development, but also to mental illness or to the generation of, mental illness. And, and so I want to also kind of flesh out some of the hot button topics and just some of the vocabulary that we tend to see when we're talking about this topic, right? And so CBD is like this thing that's everywhere, right? People are putting CBD and, you know, seltzer water and on lotions. And I was at the the dog store yesterday and or the pet store and they had some CBD dog food. And I was like, Surprise. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know exactly how that's supposed to affect my pet, you know? Um, and so I think parents might have some similar questions. So when we're thinking about CBD and THC, these letters, you know, can you kind of break down what is the difference between CBD and THC? So THC is the intoxicant part of the plant um, and, of course, very psychoactive. CBD, or cannabidiol, is also psychoactive because it does have an impact on, on humans and the brain, but it's not an intoxicant. So you technically, it's not believed that you can get high from CBD. Now, it's being promoted 
you know, it's of course a cure all for all kinds of things, including, I guess, uh, dogs that bark too loud or whatever with animals. Um, so what do we know about CBD for, uh, for health? There is one medication that now is approved. It's, it's all CBD. It's called Epidiolex that is FDA approved, but its value or its efficacy is limited to, to some rare childhood epilepsies. So, but very effective. Um, I think that kind of led to some of the interest in the medical marijuana where parents were finding out with, who had children with these severe um, uh, medication resistant epilepsies that uh, marijuana was helping. Well, it wasn't the THC in the marijuana that the parents were giving the kids, it was the CBD, kind of, kind of fortunate. So it, it's uh, probably a very safe and effective drug for, for children, CBD product, Epidiolex. Um, but um, from a science standpoint, CBD hasn't been proven to be effective for all the other ailments for which it's promoted. And that's why um, it's sold in a lot of places that don't even have uh, medical marijuana or legal marijuana. And the packaging will claim that it doesn't know um, that it scientifically helps with its with its ailments. It, it might have some sort of soft indication on it. Uh, so they get around the FDA because the FDA hasn't approved it um, uh, for any reason except the one I just mentioned. Synthetic THC um, is approved by the FDA to help with the nausea from those who are taking uh, chemotherapy or suffering from AIDS. So there is also just that little FDA approved sidebar. So um, I caution people, I, the CBD, some have said it is a modern version of snake oil. It's um, It's got a lot of attention. It's capitalizing on people's placebo effects, or I call it placebo vulnerability. Um, and it's, uh, it's high marketing profile has led to a lot of attention. It is getting studied. And so I know people are looking at it in two ways. One is, actually, could it help those who have symptoms and suffering from schizophrenia? So stay tuned on that one, because I heard a, a very uh, high profile elite scholar talk about a, a study where they're looking at this. And then it's been looked at to, to help with those who have a withdrawal symptoms if you have a cannabis use disorder. Wouldn't that be ironic? Another part of the plant helps you if you fell prey to another chemical in the plant, THC being that other chemical. We'll see. It, these things take a while. Um, I, I just caution people, I don't know how well it's going to help with pain over the long haul or help with anxiety or your sleep. Um, because there's so many testimonies of people saying it helps, I, I can see why the market's taking advantage of that. But um, you can give people a sugar pill or a placebo pill for a, an ailment and, and, and prop it up as being helpful for a particular problem you're having. And a lot of people will, will find relief for a certain period of time. A small period of time, but it won't, it's not going to help the underlying pathology. And you may find the placebo effect where it's off. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to point out is that anytime we're talking about supplements, supplements for the most part do not have to undergo this FDA, FDA approval, right? Like Correct. we think that they do, right? Like we think things like fish oil or whatever, the multivitamins that they do have these really stringent standards, but they don't. That oftentimes they're made with fillers, they're made with cornstarch, they're made with all kinds of stuff um, that don't have to have this, this backed reasoning for their use, right? So we think about food, right? And we think about drugs, and then supplements are like this other thing. That's why you can see these these uh, these things that have popped up in so many different ways and in so many different places. And so it's just important to remember that, hey, this isn't a regulated thing. There's no governing body who's coming alongside each one of these distributors with CBD and saying, yes, this is good CBD or no, this is not, right? And so I think parents or you know anybody, when you're thinking about this, has to keep that in mind. Uh, just like you would keep that in mind for any of the type of supplements that you would get for health, right? Um, so 
I think that that was a super helpful way um, for us understanding this. And you kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but you know, let's talk a little bit more about the differences between some of the common smoking devices among teens, right? So we understand that that THC or marijuana can be used in a variety of ways. And like um, in your experience when you're talking about this, what, what do people need to know about the different ways in which people are using marijuana? So one of the big differences is if you are not using an electronic cigarette or, or a vaping device or um, a certain kind of pipe, you're probably then just smoking the leaf. And the leaf version of most cannabis products is going to have um, an upper, upper limit of THC around 20%. But if you are using oils or a dab, the wax, which can be put in electronic cigarettes or some water pipes, well, then you're getting um, you know, much, much higher potency. So it, um, back in the day, it was harder to, um, if you had hash the, or the blonde little rock, um, which you used in a water pipe, that might have doubled your THC from 3 to 4% to 8%. So that, that was, again, parents might reflect on, on the high end stuff. Back in the day, it was even that is, is um, uh, very weak compared to what's normal. Uh, normative uh, in the, in the current landscape of what you can buy. So electronic cigarettes because of vaping uh, of nicotine, and they now are are uh, a vehicle for for uh, for taking cannabis, and it just allows you to buy the products that are very high end and administer uh, something quite potent in a short amount of time. Yeah. So you talked about twenty percent being kind of like the upper end now for the flower or for the leaf, right? And then even in the 90% for oils or um, for those types of things that are being used for vaping, right? And so, you know, in your experience, does vaping lead to people eventually smoking weed or marijuana? Well, using nicotine, whether you vape it or not, is um, it can be a pathway for for many teenagers. Way back in the day, in my youth, it was a common pathway for for to for a young person to start smoking cigarettes, and then they'd move to alcohol, and then some would escalate to marijuana. Um, Cigarette smoking by teenagers using a cigarette has dropped significantly. It's a wonderful public health message, and there's a lot of success there. Um, but uh, because of electronic cigarettes and the belief that vaping is safer, much, much safer, it's a little safer, but not much, much safer. Teens are now starting to pick up the vaping of nicotine habit. And it strikes me that that's really an easy pathway then to to just vape cannabis if you feel so inclined to graduate to a, a more potent drug. Yeah, the the smell is different, right? So it's it's a little bit harder to to be able to like regulate or track, right? Like you'll have your physical effects that you would if somebody is smoking marijuana, right? Like their eyes might be bloodshot or their motor function might be uh, impaired or slow or their thought process cognition might be slower. But as in terms of like being able to understand from just like, hey, I, you smell like you've been smoking weed, which was kind of one of the things that was the most apparent when it came to being able to to understand if your teen or your young adult is, you know, smoking weed. Like you go in the basement, what what's that smell? You've been smoking weed, right? But but now with oils, it's it's completely different. They're gonna be in the next room over um, smoking, and you would never know if they're vaping, right? Because because of the way that that the smell is administered, it's it's very different. Um, yeah, you'd have to look at more behaviors these days that are tougher to um, ascertain or even distinguish between just normal teen behavior, but no, that's intoxication. Yeah. I mean, acting silly, um, having the munchies. Okay, those are two common things. But no, that can happen during adolescence, a normal teen. Um, you know, I tell parents, look for the bigger things. Um, is, are they showing much less interest in usual activities that they were interested in earlier, um, including school or um, hobbies? 
um, is the peers that they're hanging out with. Do, do those peers make you a little more worried? Because they might be uh, cannabis users. Um, well, how about the language? Is there just more discussions about, do they care about what 420 is? You know, does the teen uh, rally around that? Uh, do they use the word dab or skunk or things like that? Um, uh, you, know, you know, it's tougher to, to ascertain these days. You don't have all the physical. Now, you might you might have, you know, paraphernalia. So um, if you grabbed a, a electronic vaping pen, you could, with a little detective work, figure out, is that nicotine in there or does that look like, you know, marijuana residue? But that's that's harder than it used to be when you could look for a bong or look for a roach clip. Right. So let's kind of break this down. So if I'm a parent or if I have a loved one and I'm afraid that marijuana is, it's not a recreational thing. Either the person's so young that you're certain that it's affecting their cognitive ability. Um, it could lead to mental illness. It could you know, have a variety of other problems, or it's just getting in the way of them being able to launch into adulthood, right? Like there's that the idea of that failure to launch thing, right? Where you've got the young adult, it's really difficult for them to be able to get through school, uh, to move up in their job, or to be able to like make action on the goals that they even set for themselves, right? And that marijuana is like a contributor for that. And so for those people who have a child or a loved one who's struggling with that, what would you tell them? Like, what's the best way to approach someone who's using marijuana? And it's, and it's not a recreational thing anymore. It's, it's drastically impacting their life. So one of the things uh, we, we tell parents and teach parents in some of our programs is following some basic principles that hopefully optimize getting some feedback from your teenager as well as a change in their thinking. So I call it the I see, I feel, I think, then there's listen, and then there's I will do this and I'm hoping you will do this. So there's these several layers, but the first three is it just expressing to the teenager your view on I'm seeing some things, I am feeling some things, I am thinking this means um, that you might be using substances, including cannabis. You know, so I see that you're you're not as interested in school. I feel that you were you're getting less connected to the home, I feel like uh, we've grown apart. Um, and then, but then you have, you got to pause and not um, get too far into that. You got to let the teenager reflect and react. And, uh, you know, some teenagers are going to perhaps push back and be defensive, but that's okay. That would be natural. You got to just hang in there and listen um, and don't overreact to that if there's emotionality going on. But then the last two parts are where you say that you will do some things to help with the situation, but you're asking the teenager also to put some things on a list or at least one thing. Now that can vary, you know, for some parents, it might mean um, I'm, I'm going to require, you know, that you've got to check in more frequently. I'm going to require that uh, you got some hours that you got to attend to on weekends. Um, I'm not going to let you use the car unless I'm certain, you know, that you're safe. Um, but it might also mean the parent's going to say, I'm, I will be more con more attentive to when you ask about certain things and you want certain things from me or the household. But you ask the teenager also to do some things that you think are important to promote health. It might mean that you also, you know, put a condition on it and say, OK, well, we've got to see some changes, Tommy or Sally. If if these changes aren't going to happen, then um, then I'm going to. Um, Consider that we go in and get just a professional evaluation and get a professional to uh, to do an interview and figure out what's, what the problem might be if there is enough of a problem to, to get some counseling. Some, some parents um, are going to probably be aware that there's an issue when it might already be at that point where it is helpful to get a professional to weigh in. It's one of the problems of parenting a teenager. Often the teenager might have some issues going on in their life, whether it's mental health or, or substance use. 
Well, and that's escalating underneath the parents' radar. And they don't see it for various reasons, because just the way life is, the way the teenage world and the way parenting is. Um, and, and the parents still doing a great job. This is not, you know, anyone's fault. This is so normal and natural. But by the time you see something, it's past the point of early intervention or early discussion. It, it might require already, some, you know, professional to weigh in. So it's a difficult thing to negotiate. But I just remind parents, um, you, you sometimes are going to need to be faced with a, with maybe a tough talk that's a bit uncomfortable, but set some time aside. Tell the teenager you got something important. You, you, you know, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes, of course, no distractions. And uh, you go through kind of that uh, that conversation. So just to summarize, what I hear you saying is we're starting out with these I statements. I see, I feel, I think, right? And what's what strikes me as important about that is you're not saying you, you, you. Right, Like you're talking about how you feel. You're talking about what's going on with you. Um, and it's not accusatory. You're not saying that I feel like you are being a bad child, right? Like this is this is like letting them know where you're at, right? The second part of that is also saying being willing to listen. Because unless they feel like you are willing to understand where they're coming from, then no changes are going to be made, right? Like we don't want to interact with people who misunderstand us in general, especially in like that parent-child relationship. And what you've said is that there's probably some things that are going on beneath the surface that they haven't felt comfortable or safe or just haven't shared with you before. So you have to be able to create that space for them. And then the third component of that is being able to set some kind of boundary, like in order for this to work, this also has to be the case. I will do this and you will do that, right? And setting those clear boundaries allows you to be able to, one, measure whether or not there's like a, a continued issue with this, and two, to be able to let the, the teen or young adult know exactly what you expect of them. And, and then like following up with that, hey, this is hard. Sometimes it's also hard to be objective. And by the way, not all of us, you know, who are parents were endowed with these types of tools from the get go. Maybe we didn't have these, these uh, examples when we were growing up. And, and maybe this isn't something that we ever had to encounter. So it can be great to have an objective professional opinion to be able to evaluate whether or not something is a real substance use issue, um, or if it's experimentation, or if it's like some underlying mental health thing that hasn't been exposed, but marijuana might be exacerbating. Is that right? Yeah, no, excellent summary. Um, hopefully, people have access to uh, to good adolescent services if they realize they need to go that that route um, but a good counselor who um, knows how to talk to young people and is you know a sensitive to these issues about co-occurring and not over pathologizing uh, teenage substance use as being addiction but realizing eh, it could actually be you know um, a um, an important response that the teenager is making to something else that's going on in his or her life. And that might be the most important thing to delve into with, with some possible counseling. So with Sandstone Care, one of the things that we do is that when a parent or, you know, a loved one calls in or even a young adult, they'll come in, we'll, they'll talk to like an admissions coordinator who will kind of just go through this questionnaire, right? And by the way, you know, in the show notes, in the description box, of this episode, there's a five question quiz that you can take either you can give it to your young adult to take or you can take it for them. That's kind of talking about those questions that Ken was, uh, Dr. Winters was explaining about like changes in behavior. Hey, is the, have their grades slumped? Are they not as interested in the things that they're normally interested in, right? Like, um, and so you can take this really quick five question quiz similar to what our admissions coordinators do and they say, okay, like it might be worth having an assessment. And so from there, you're referred to a professional who's going to get to know you and to get to know um, your teen or young adult and be able to understand whether or not 
there, there is an underlying issue or there's not. So sometimes parents come in and they think, my kid needs rehab, residential rehab, right? And that's not the case. There might be like a chaotic home environment or there might be some outpatient work that just needs to be done where they're seeing a counselor um, throughout the week. Um, and then sometimes there, there's parents who are coming in and they're saying, hey, like, um, I think my kid needs to just see a counselor once a week when the issue is actually much more pronounced. But having an objective person who's, you know, trained in this and who can also see it without the view of emotion that tends to be charged with these situations can be a super helpful thing. So, you know, there are resources like Sandstone Care and there's, there's a lot of great resources out there um, that parents can use. And I agree with you. I think that that's a really strong foundation. I haven't heard somebody say it so clear cut where with the statements of like, first say how you're feeling, um, then listen, then create those, those, uh, those boundaries and those expectations. I think that's like a really practical thing that can, that can help a lot of people. I also remind parents, even though your teenager is perhaps uh, emotionally showing some distance, more distance to you than when they were a child. Um, teenagers, when they reflect upon the importance of their parent during their teen years, typically say, I appreciated that my parents hung in there with me. I know I was a challenge. Um, I probably frustrated him or her a lot, but they were important to me. Um, verbally, behavior-wise, you might not think you're, uh, you're making a big impact, but um, you probably are. You want to hang in there. Um, and stick with it because so many teenagers um, do reflect and do realize that um, uh, their parents are still very, very important to them. Yeah, I, I, that's such a good point, Dr. Winters, is that, you know, it can feel like a very thankless job sometimes, you know, um, and you're not going to see the fruits of that labor for years and years and years. But as you were saying that, I was thinking myself, you know, I was I was a real hellion. Like people might not understand this about me, but me as a as a teen and as a young adult was, um, you know, I grew up in a chaotic environment. I was a foster kid, um, grew up with parents who were addicts. And so you can imagine that that kind of played a role in how I interacted and the things that I did, right? And I was a real challenge, but almost every single day, I think about those people who kind of poured into me and who were able to be a steady rock. They were kind of these counter examples to the things and the destructive destruction and chaos that I grew up around. And, and I look back with so much fondness and I really appreciate it. You know, it's like, it's almost like, you know, how in the world did they, did they put up with me? Did they stick through it? Um, <laughs> and now almost, you know, humorously, like ironically, here I am hosting a uh, substance abuse and mental health podcast. And so, you know, if anything, it's, it's a shining example that when you're able to show love through these times that, um, that it matters and that, that even in those teen years that we remember and that we care <laughs> and that we're super thankful for the hard work. Are you saying that your parents when you were 16, wouldn't have predicted that this is what you'd be doing right now when you're in your 30s? They would have never, and you know, they would have never have thought this, um, especially the people who knew me around that time when somehow we catch up later in life. They're like, oh my God, like, how did you come out on the other, on the other side of that? Um, and so, you know, my sister tells me all the time, she's like, she's like, I can't believe you turned out the way you turned out. And it makes me feel good, right? But at the same time, it, it just goes to show that how, how important those people are in our lives and how much of an impact that they make um, in those formative years and beyond. Um, Dr. Ken, where can people go to learn more about you and the work that you do? Well, they should feel free to email me, um, uh, W-I-N-T-E-001 at U-M-N dot E-D-U. So I think there's maybe two or three things that people might find of interest. If you're a service provider, 
working in schools, prevention specialists working in schools. We have um, a nice uh, product resource for how you can um, teach middle school students, particularly about teen brain development. So it, the resource includes a PowerPoint file, some exercises, um, you know, engaging kind of science uh, based education. And then the resource also includes a parent uh, component. So if you have an opportunity to give a parent talk, we have a PowerPoint file, some exercises, things to make the, um, uh, the activity engaging. So it's not just you, uh, lecturing for, for an hour, but an opportunity to hopefully do something engaging with parents. It's about teen brain development as well as, you know, the importance of parenting to, um, to raise uh, a drug-free adolescent. Um, and then if you're um, a counselor and you want to, um, and you need to give talks about how to use, or you want to learn more about how to use brain development science to improve your counseling skills, also send me an email because we have um, some a, a file where we've accumulated um, what are some of the, the best bridges being built between those that are understanding teen brain development and what are the, the best evidence-based counseling principles that help teenagers who either have a drug problem or mental health? So we think there's a lot the brain scientists have, have learned that are helpful and can inform um, counselors to improve your work. And if there's other questions you had that came up, feel free to, um, to follow up with me. You know, you keep saying we. Who is we in this situation, Dr. Winters? Well, there's my group at the Oregon Research Institute. Um, even though I'm based in Minnesota, I, I now still stay active as a researcher with my colleagues that are, are based there. We're all behavioral scientists. And then some of the resources I mentioned was developed when I was at the Center for Adolescent Substance Abuse Research. And so uh, my wonderful colleagues and staff there um, really helped shape those resources. Another excellent resource for parents is Google Johnny's Ambassador. Johnny's apostrophe S Ambassador. And you will find a wonderful website that got developed by Laura, which is Johnny's mother. And it's a, um, a grassroots organization to educate particularly parents about raising a teenager these days and hoping you can keep them free from any harm from using marijuana. Her son, Johnny, fell victim to, uh, to cannabis abuse, and she's devoted um, her time and resources to educating parents. And her resource not only includes great updates, but she also signs up scientists to give very interesting webinars, usually uh, about once a month kind of thing. And of course, those webinars are um, are retained, and you can you can replay them. So just Google Johnny's Ambassador, and you'll uh, you'll see I think a, a great parent resource. I'll link those up in the show notes so that you know anybody who wants to check out that stuff. And I got a feeling uh, I'm going to reach out to Johnny's Johnny's mom over here because it sounds like a really important thing. Uh, question, with those files and with um, those resources, are those free or are yes. those like, is it, yeah. oh, they are. All free. And we just ask that people, uh, if they use them, just cite their source. Cool. Um, I'm going to see if I can also get that stuff linked up in the show notes uh, and on the blog post that this is going to be, these videos and this podcast will live. So um, that will be a great resource for, like you said, anybody who's in like substance prevention or, you know, professionals who are trying to have some really solid data. So awesome, awesome stuff. Dr. Ken, you have been a huge wealth of knowledge on this topic, and I'm so glad that we got the chance uh, to talk. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Clint. It was a pleasure. Everyone have a rest of a good day. You can find more about Dr. Winters and his um, work in the show notes of this podcast or in the description box of this video. And in the meantime, we will see you on the next episode. If you want to learn more about treatment options for you, your teen or young adult, 
Then tell us about your situation on a confidential call using the number in the show notes or live chat with us at sandstonecare.com. We'll connect you with the treatment that you need. And if we're not the right fit, we'll get you where you need to go. Be well and remember that change is possible.